Driver's Ed. And uh, like we've done every day, please sign in under the comments and also to sign in with sending me a text message that you have entered the YouTube classroom for Driver's Ed. And we'll get started in about, about a minute. Okay, looks like we got a few people coming on. Hey, Seth. Dan. Charlotte. Nathan, Brad, welcome, welcome. Hope, Andy. Annie, Zach. And Connor. Seth, and Trevor, Jason, I think we've got a crew. Let's get this ball going. Uh, today's class is going to be focused on getting behind the wheel of the vehicle. The first class we had on Monday was just an overview of driver's ed, basically what we wanted to cover in the 30-hour program. What's the responsibility of you and your parents? Yesterday we focused on the highway transportation system and basically what to expect when we get out on the roads, why our roads built the way that they are, what can we do to make them a little bit safer. So today's focus will be on the automobile, getting behind the wheel of the car and getting to go. Now I know that most of you have done some type of driving, so this may be a little bit redundant, uh, but hopefully I will add some information here that you've never thought about or didn't do at the time when you started driving with your parents and you'll implement that into your driving habits. So what I want you to do is get a piece of paper and something to write with, because today's gonna probably be a little bit more notes. I don't have um, much for videos, while we're having the classroom session, let me get out of out of this. So we're going to basically be focusing on breaking down the different devices and uh, equipment, uh, things that we have on our car to help us drive better and, and drive more safely. So that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, halfway through today, I'm going to hold up a whiteboard. There'll be a question that I want you to write down that's going to show me that you are still participating in today's session. And I want you to answer it at the end of viewing today's video. So at the very end of today, we're going to see a long video. I'm going to actually cut out of this session and have you go to the YouTube channel and actually um, take a look at the driver's ed vehicle. I didn't want to do a handhold and try to transmit into here. It was just too complicated. And I am still trying to get used to sending you either messages by email or text message. So please, in your comment on the YouTube channel, write down whether you've received uh, a group text from me and whether you've gotten yesterday the homework assignment with knowing your vehicle. That will give me some idea who's getting it and who's not. I forgot who it was, but someone's having a problem receiving things through the email, or maybe it was the phone. Well, anyways, if you don't have an Apple product, an Apple phone, an Apple computer, an Apple iPad, Samsung, or uh, you know, an Android is just going to be hard sometimes to communicate back and forth. So I'm going to have to work a little bit harder to make sure that you're getting the information. So what I want you to uh, write down, I want you to write down, are you really ready to drive? And what I want you to, to focus on today is basically before you get into the car and start it up and moving the vehicle down the roadway, 
just like a pilot. If you've ever been on a plane before, you know as they let you enter the airplane and they bring you in, in in groups is that the pilot is going through a checklist. The stewardess is going through a checklist. So before they take off, there are certain things that have to be uh, checked off and okay, because if something's not okay, then you've got to deal with it before you get up in the air. And basically getting ready to drive in an automobile is really the same thing. Before you put your car out on the road, you want to make sure um, physically, uh, mentally, emotionally, you've got it all together and you're going to be able to drive out on the road safely. So let's kind of go through some of the different steps that I want you to uh, think about. So the first thing I want you to write down is once you have your driver's license, and I know you know how to get to school, you know how to get probably to your grandparents' house, things like that, but for the most part, if someone's giving you directions, you probably don't know how to get there. So what I want you to write down in your notes is, do I know where I'm going and what is the best route that I should be taking? Because not every route would be your best route. Sometimes getting off a highway onto a less travel road will actually get you there quicker if there's a tie-up on the highway. We saw yesterday about uh, traffic jams and, and, and the flow of traffic. We want to make sure on wet, rainy days or snow that maybe we want to stay off our back roads and get onto a well-traveled road or a highway that's going to be maintained or even traveled more often, and it's going to give you better traction, better visibility, because it's a little bit more wide open. So you have to be a little bit smart about which road you're going to take to where you want to go. The other thing is make sure that you know if you have to make multiple stops, you don't want to waste fuel, you don't want more wear and tear on your vehicle. So basically minimize the length of your trip and the time that you're in your vehicle. Because the longer the trip, more of a chance of being hit by another car, uh, more wear and tear, like I said, on the vehicle, and you're consuming more fuel. Now, I, I left down here, do you need directions? Now... I made this PowerPoint many, many years ago. This was, you know, probably 15 years ago we've been teaching this type of material. Back 15, 20 years ago, GPS was just for the cars that were upper level vehicles. Cars that were just off the lot, you know, that most people were driving. You didn't have that ability uh, to have GPS built in the way that we have right now. So with GPS, we can, before we leave, we want to make sure that we type in the address that we want to take and we can listen to the direction of the device telling us turning left, turning right, what to be looking for. It makes traveling a little bit easier. But if you don't have a GPS, have someone that's next to you to help you read the signs and get you to where you want to go. Because if you have to do it all on your own, especially as a new driver, you're more apt to make mistakes or miss an exit because you're paying attention to someone or looking at a piece of paper that's telling you go up to two traffic lights and take a right and you're missing things and you don't want that to happen. Your physical and emotional state, and I'm not going to talk too much about this, but if anybody's played sports before, you basically know that after a game or after a practice, there could be uh, sprains, there could be lack of mobility uh, with your neck. Uh, be very careful when you get into a car when you know that you're not going to be operating it the way that you normally do because it will make you less of a safe driver. The other thing I want you to think about is your emotions. You should never get in the car when you are very upset. That is probably the emotion that we want to stay away from driving because your emotions follow you wherever you go. So if you're really excited, let's say that you just found out that you ordered a brand new guitar and it just came, you could be so psyched about that that you're not picking up signs or pedestrians and things like that. You're maybe going a little bit faster because you're just thinking about, I got to get home. I can't wait to uh, open it up. Or the, by, the opposite of excitement is being really depressed where you just found out that maybe the family pet had just passed away. Um, you're not going to be in the right state of mind to really focus on driving that well. So you 
basically want someone else to drive or um, wait. Wait till the emotion changes. Okay, you don't want to get behind the wheel at that point. Okay, write down weather. Now, we're going to have a whole section probably in two weeks on hazardous weather conditions. But the ones I want you to write down right now, rain we encounter every month of the year. So we're going to have to be learning how to drive in rain. Biggest problem with rain, a lot of people think it's hydroplaning or lifting our tires, lifting up on the water and losing contact and, and sliding. That doesn't happen that often, but we do have problems with visibility, not so much with the front windshield, but if you don't have a hatchback, because a hatchback will have a wiper. If you have a four-door sedan, you don't have a wiper in the back. So visibility, write this down. Rain is, is a problem with visibility to the sides and to the rear. Your wipers are in front. It's going to make it pretty adequate to drive. But when you're making a quick check left or right in rain, all that droplets of water is going to distort your vision and things won't stand out that well and you're going to make bad decisions. Same thing with behind you. That's why you got to put your rear defroster on. So rain, fog is a problem. More so in spring and fall when you have the increase or decrease of temperature. So when it goes from cold to hot or hot to cold. So when we have that change, okay, and any moisture around, fog is going to be an issue. So we want to make sure that we know how to drive well in fog. Snow and darkness, okay, and that's all going to be covered, like I said, in the third week of class. Okay, traffic conditions. Now I wrote this down. As a new driver, you're going to be driving mainly to school and probably to work or sporting events. Now, the weekends are for you for, you know, doing what you like to do. But the majority of your driving is going to be what we call um, high traffic volume. So anytime between the hours of 7 and 9, 4 and 6, which are also your opening and closing of schools, you're going to have more cars on the road, maybe running through stop signs, running through traffic lights, tailgating, going faster than normal. So as a new driver, you've got to be able to handle everything that's coming at you at the right time to drive well. So be very careful uh, on those high stress, high risk times of driving. Then of course on holidays too. Holidays are going to be a high volume time to be out on the road and driving. There is the driver's ed vehicle. That is what you will be driving. Now, this is our third class, and usually by now, uh, I have probably driven with at least uh, seven to ten of you. Uh, you would have had your first lesson. You would have really been going over what we're covering today. Today is really the primer to get you out and to drive. So the first week of class, usually most people have one or two hours in with me by Saturday. But... Here we are, quarantined, in the house, just learning what we have to do. So what I've done is I've done a video, and I did it uh, about six, seven months ago. I went out to the, my driver's ed vehicle here, and I went around the vehicle, and I showed you all the things that we're talking about. So at the end of today's class, you're going to go watch that video and get a feel visually what it looks like around the car, inside the car, what are the devices and, and equipment options that I have in my vehicle that you'll be utilizing when you drive. So you can see this is a Toyota Camry. It's a hybrid. It's a 2015. It's got a leather interior. It's got a good radio. It's got GPS. It's got a sunroof. So I enjoy being in it, you know, eight, nine hours a day. And I hope that you enjoy driving it. But what I want you to write down in your notes, and we kind of learned this yesterday, that the length and width of your vehicle and the horsepower, we didn't mention that yesterday, but the horsepower of your vehicle, because it is important to know how to pull away from a stop sign or merging into traffic, it's going to be different in every car. So write down, every car that you drive will, will feel different. It's going to respond different with the movement of your hands, the acceleration, the braking. So don't judge yourself too harshly when you drive in the driver's ed vehicle for the first time. It's going to feel awkward. 
and you're going to make mistakes with stopping and accelerating. It's just the way that it is. But usually after your second and third time, you're going to get a, a pretty good feel for the car. So the first thing I want you to write down, and this is going to be part of the video, as I said, there are five things that you need to do when you get out to the driver's ed vehicle. So number one, approach the vehicle and make a check around the vehicle. Now I want you to do this if the vehicle has been left for any period of time, like over an hour or two. Now, if if we were in school right now and you were driving B period, the next person that drives C period probably wouldn't have to check around the vehicle because we know certain things to be true. Okay, and we'll talk about what are what would be true, what would be okay, what wouldn't you have to check. So when I want you to look around, actually my face here, let's see, I'm going to get out of here for just a second. Let's see if I can minimize this. Whoop, there we go. I'm gone. Okay, to look around your vehicle, these are the items that I want you to write down. First of all, I want you to check the tires. That's the most important thing. You want to make sure that you don't have what we call soft tires or underinflated tires. There have been times that I've driven with students and when we came back to school we noticed it looked a little soft and actually during our drive we ran over a, a piece of wood that had a nail in it and we had a slow leak so it's better to change the tire here in the parking lot than to be on the road and have to change the tire where we have to pull over check to see if there are any fluids that are leaking out around the vehicle could be like oil, antifreeze, could be gasoline. Your car, and that's part of why I want you to do the homework assignment of knowing your vehicle, is that you should know that your car has fluids. Your fluids to your vehicle are like the blood to our system. Okay, We need to make sure that our blood system is pure and running correctly. If not, you're going to get a blood diffusion. They got to purify your blood. The same thing with gas, oil, uh, power steering, automatic transmission fluid. If that fluid isn't correct, whether it be levels or purity, your car is or your truck is not going to run correctly. So we want to have a basic of understanding that we have fluids in our vehicle. How do we check them and how or what type do we put into our vehicle? Now, you may not think license plate is that big of a deal, but a license plate is important to make sure that you still have because we're going to be talking about, oh, well, it's the last bullet here, carjacking. People will steal other people's license plates. Could be a prank, but more than anything, it's probably somebody that has stolen a vehicle. Think about it. Why would someone steal a car and still keep the regular license plate on? So if someone's stealing a car, they're going to take off the license plate and put something else on. So they're going to be stealing two things, a car and somebody else's license plate. So maybe you didn't have your car stolen because you had it locked, but they may have taken your plates just to use. Okay, So that's why. Make sure no one's cracked through a window. Uh, make sure that nobody has put anything in your vehicle. You don't want to get inside if someone's put in like an animal or something. Check for animals. Write this down in your notes. If you have a cat, probably more so a cat than a dog, but make sure that you don't have anything lingering around the vehicle. Cats like to be around a vehicle that's kind of warm, so just kind of give your car a, a slap or two, startle a cat. That way it's not near the vehicle. Now, carjacking, I want you to write down, and this was something that we had on the last slide. Carjacking is where you are approaching your vehicle with your keys in your hand. The easiest car to steal is a car that's already running or someone approaching their car with their keys in their hand. Okay, carjacking, this is what I want you to write down, is more likely to take place at stop signs traffic lights, and parking lots, like at a mall or a gas station. 
Now, we weren't carjacked in the driver's ed vehicle, but I will tell you a story that really scared the driver, and I had an observer at the time in the back. We were in downtown Dur uh, Dover on Halloween, probably about 12, 13 years ago. We were at a stop sign, and someone tried to get in the back seat behind the driver. They grabbed the door handle. They're pulling on the door handle, knocking on the window. Come on, let me in, let me in, let me in. They were trying to get inside the driver's ed vehicle. Now, being Halloween, and it was probably around 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, I have a sneaking suspicion that the person was pretty drunk. And I think they looked at the yellow driver's ed sign on top of the car and thought we were a taxi. So they were just trying to get a ride. But boy, did it scare the driver, and boy, did it scare the observer in the back. So very important to make sure that your car is locked every time that you leave it. And to make sure that when you approach your vehicle, that you're holding on to your key to make sure that if someone is coming towards you, that you can hit the panic button and scare them off. So... Keep your car in a well-lit area. Keep your keys in your hand. Get ready to press that button. And actually, if you hold your key, I'll get back here. Just, whoop, that's not what I wanted. Let me get back. I don't have my keys with me because I'm not driving. But if this was my keys, if you hold your key out and someone's coming towards you, you could actually poke someone in the eye, scrape their face. Now, it won't really hurt them that much, but it certainly will make a mark. So when they're looking for this guy... You're going to say, look for a guy that's got, you know, a big scrape across his cheek. You know, brown hair, you know, had a long, straggly beard. They'll probably be able to find this guy. Okay, so leave a mark on him. You know, try to fend him off with your, with your key if you can. Another reason why you want to look around is that down south, you may encounter an alligator. Can you imagine approaching your vehicle and having this come out from underneath the car? I certainly would, would be running. Uh, pretty scary. Okay, we've looked around the car. It looks pretty safe. No fluids. The tires look fine. No broken glass. We've got our license plate. So now we're inside the vehicle. Okay, so we got four more things we want to go over. So we looked around the vehicle. This is the second thing. Make sure you lock the doors. We just talked about carjacking. So to make sure no one's getting in while you're getting ready to drive, lock the doors. Okay, true story. Okay, there was a person, I know some of you live in Barrington. At the Barrington Irving gas station, someone, a young female, was pumping gas and she was going to pay by cash. So she went into the uh, Irving gas station to pay and when she came out and drove away, she didn't realize when she went inside, someone jumped in the back of her vehicle and they carjacked her. Okay. Uh, these things happen. It's just not in the city. It happens around here. So make sure that you lock your vehicle when you leave it. So when she went inside, she should have been pressing a button to lock the car. And on another story in Massachusetts where a young girl was walking to her car with her keys in the hand. There was someone underneath her car, and as she went to unlock the door, the person underneath the car went around the back of her legs with a knife and cut both Achilles tendons, and she fell to the ground. Now, when someone cuts your Achilles tendons, you can't stand up. He rolls out from underneath the car, grabs the car keys, he drives off, okay? So make sure you keep your car in a well-lit area, look around underneath, look inside, Especially if you're female, make sure things are safe. You don't want anybody getting into your vehicle. Okay, third thing. Is to adjust the seat. You should be very comfortable with driving. Now, it's kind of hard where I'm sitting here with my desk and you can't see me. I'm going to lean back a little bit. But you, you should have a slight bend to your elbow. Okay? You don't want to be out straight. And you don't want the wheel too close either. So a slight bend to your elbow. And we'll be talking about hand position in just a little bit. Make sure everybody is belted. Okay, It is a law in New Hampshire. Anyone under the age of 18 has to be belted. So in the driver's ed vehicle, you have to be 
in the car and a seatbelt. So we don't have any college students in this class. But if if you think that it's not a big deal to be out driving without a seatbelt on if you're a passenger in the back seat or front seat, as long as the driver is okay. No, everybody should be in a seatbelt. Uh, it is against the law to be under the age of 18 in New Hampshire without a seatbelt on. And in some states, you, you have to have it on even as an adult. So that's the question a lot of people ask me. Wonder if I drive out of state and go to a state and I don't know all their laws. Yes, you still have to do certain things. Now, how are you going to know that? Well, as you enter a state, there will probably be signs on the highway indicating what you're supposed to do. Now, most police officers, and I'm friends with a lot of police officers, they'll usually give people fair warning saying, well, I don't know how long you're going to stay in New Hampshire, but this is our law. Uh, if I catch you again, I'm going to give you a ticket, but right now it's a warning. I think most states would do the same thing with you unless it's very egregious where it's something you just shouldn't be doing, like drinking and driving. They're not going to give you any leeway with that. But cell phone use, every state has some type of law. I wouldn't chance it. Now, they get kind of fuzzy with uh, Bluetooth and being underage, under the age of 18 with blue, uh, with handheld, but I just wouldn't do it. Seat belts should always have your seat belt on. You're never running the risk of having any problem in any state if you have yours on. Adjusting mirrors. Now, as I said yesterday, older cars back in the 30s and 40s didn't even have side mirrors. So in your notes, what I want you to write down with side mirrors is make sure that you can see mostly what's behind you or beside you. You don't want to see a lot of your vehicle, whether it be in your rear view mirror, the post in the back, or in your side view mirror is the side of your car. You don't want to see much. In your side mirror, if you take a look at the slide here, the bottom picture, is that the side of the car is basically maybe a tenth of the mirror. I mean, it's that small. And the reason why I still like you to use a little bit of the side of the mirror is it gives you a reference where your car is compared to where, in this case, there's a Toyota van behind us. So it gives you just a little bit of an idea of what is happening around you. Now, I am going to show you a slide, if I can get to it. For some reason, it's not changing. I'm going to get out again. So notice in the rearview mirror, in this picture, you can see the white truck. And then in your left side mirror, you can still see the truck. And over in your right side mirror, you can still see the car. Okay, so it reinforces what you see in your rear view mirror, you're going to start to see in your side view mirror. But a lot of people think this is redundant. This is just, you know, wasted use of a mirror. So push your side mirrors out even a little bit further. So if you take a look at this picture, where the dotted orange line is and where the dotted blue line is, okay, is basically from the dotted line to the blue line is what you're seeing in your side view mirror. Same thing with the dotted orange and the solid orange. That's what you're seeing in your side mirror. So that's wasted. So what they're telling you to do is to push your mirrors out a little bit further. Notice there's no dotted line. The side of the orange line and the side of the blue line just basically touch the green line, which would be your rear view mirror, in the back. So that's kind of eliminating a good portion of your blind spot. I still like using the traditional where you still see a little bit of the side of the car where it's kind of overlap when you start driving because it's a reinforcement of what you're seeing behind you. But as you get better with driving, you want to push those mirrors out further. And that's going to help you when you drive. How can we control the movement of the vehicle? Well, I think most of us know ignition switch. You put the key in the car and uh, the ignition, and you turn it all the way to the right. And the minute you turn it all the way to the right, you let go of it. If you hold on too long, you're going to basically start grinding your starter, which isn't good. You know if you put your key in, turn just about a quarter of a turn, it turns on your accessories, but the engine doesn't turn on. So you've got to know there are different points on the turn of your key to make the car do certain things. And that was basically going to be in your reading, I believe, in part five. Transmission and clutch, that's going to be in part five or chapter five. Uh, I just wanted you to read it. You, if you don't have the questions today, if you didn't send them to me, that's fine. We'll go over those tomorrow. 
Uh, and I will look at the answers at the end of the week that you did for your homework and, and give you an idea of how you did. And then we'll take a look at the steering wheel in a moment, of course, the accelerator and the brake. So let's take a look at our steering. Oh, the gear selector. So in your notes, you're going to write down each one. And you're going to put down the letter of each word. So P, R, N, D, and then low one, low two. So I want you to write that down. Because there's a few things, I'm sure there's at least a couple of you that didn't know this. Every time that you start your car, you should be in park. The only other gear that you can be in to start your vehicle is neutral. Most people didn't know that. Yeah, you can start your car in neutral. So park locks the transmission. You should be in park whenever you start the engine. Uh, reverse is, of course, for backing up. And in your notes, I want you to write down, when you're driving in reverse, you will probably only be going between 5 and 10 or 11 miles per hour. You're not getting close to 15. I mean, you would be really moving pretty fast at 15 miles per hour in reverse. So reverse is geared lower, uh, and you go at a much, much lower speed. Neutral is an out-of-gear position. You put your car in neutral when your car is towed to a uh, garage to be fixed. You can also start your car, as we said, in neutral. And then drive is what we normally put our car in. And sometimes you'll see different, like one, two, three. And there's an overdrive on some cars when you get up onto highway speeds that you can put the overdrive on. But the only thing is when you see low one, low two, what we've done is we've almost made your automatic transmission into a standard transmission where those lower gears, one and two, is a lower torque of the vehicle. And what I want you to write down in your notes, you're going to use a lower torque, low one, low two, in bad weather, like when your tires are slipping in snow or you're going down a uh, roadway that's wet or muddy. You want your tires to turn a little bit slower, but still give you pulling power. You're going to put it in low one or low two. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, you may think this is pretty self-explanatory, but I actually had a student once that we were in a parking lot. They were driving with me for the first time. And I told them after I went through the instrument panel, I wanted them to put it and drive and to pull forward through a parking space. We were in a parking lot with an empty parking space in front of us. And the person that was driving, the student, put it in reverse and went backwards. And we almost hit a pedestrian. And I had to use my instructor brake to stop the car. And I said, I wanted you to put it in drive to go through that empty parking spot in front of us to head out of the parking lot. And they looked at me and they said, I thought R was for ride. They thought you could put the car in R and go forward. So some people, okay, that haven't driven, they don't know what these letters on the gear selector actually mean. So it takes a little time, especially when stress is pretty high on your first time out driving. You're going to be making mistakes. This is what it looks like in the driver's ed vehicle. So notice the shift pattern. Um, so you're going to be moving over to the right and then down to get into the different uh, gears that you want. Okay, so there's reverse. Okay, that's kind of got a little bit of a glare to it. Then you can see neutral drive. And we don't have one or two in the hybrid now. We have something called B, which is braking. So a lower gear actually acts like a braking um, force. Okay, let's talk about grabbing the steering wheel. And if you are in class, like I said, I love asking this question. So I'm going to have you uh, put this in the comments right now. So I'm going to see who's um, who's listening right now. So in the comments, so you should be doing this. How many of you think it's illegal to drive with one hand in New Hampshire? You can't drive with one hand, especially on your driving test. You're going to have both hands on your wheel for your when you're driving in New Hampshire, and especially on your driving test. So in the comments, put yes or no, whether you think it's illegal or not. I'm going to see what people think. I'm going to get a drink of water here in just a second.
So the comments should be coming in. So it is not illegal to drive with one hand in New Hampshire. You can legally drive with one hand. It's just not recommended. Both hands on the steering wheel is a technique. It's a technique. There are people that are born with one arm and they drive. There are people that have a broken arm and they still can legally drive. Now, you've got to make compensations for a broken arm or having one arm. And no lie, there's a person, there are people that were have been born with no arms and they still can drive. They drive with their feet. They can accelerate and brake with levers close to the steering wheel. So the steering wheel is just a mechanism to move the vehicle. But how you grab it will dictate how well you drive. But you can make compensations. So the compensation or the technique that I want you to, uh, the habit that you want to form is an 8 and 4, 9 and 3, 10 and 2 hand position with both hands on the wheel. That's going to give you better mobility to turn to the left or to the right in an emergency. Really both hands on the wheel is really for evasive mo a movement. It's not for like driving straight. Anybody can drive straight down the road with one hand on the wheel and they're not going to have any problems. But the problem's going to happen and come up when there's an emergency and they've got to turn quickly to the left or to the right where you've got to go more than a half of a turn. Now there are three other techniques that I want you to write down. Another way to uh, steer is um, one hand backing, hand over hand, and push-pull steering. And on the video, it's funny, I'm getting a lot of no's. Look at that, everybody's doing no. Good, good. Now, I, I do want to uh, preface this about on your driving test, about using one hand. I wouldn't go to my driving test and just kind of look kind of like... You got it all under control and you're just grabbing at the top of the wheel and, and steering with one hand. I would try to impress the uh, driving in, examiner and have both hands on the wheel. But if you had like an itch, you had to scratch your head or your nose or something, or you were making a turn and you're taking your hands off, that is not going to cause you to fail your driving test. But if you're driving with one hand and you make a bad turn, it's not because you got one hand on the wheel. It's because you made a bad turn. So just remember that. Uh, airbag is in the middle portion of your steering wheel, so this is why you do not want to drive. I'm going to put my uh, picture back up here. Huh. I can't get back on. Okay, we're going to have to do without a picture anymore. Um, anyways, the airbag, you don't want to be steering with your hand in the middle. You basically want to... Um, have your hands grabbing on the outside of the vehicle when you're driving. Uh, tilt position, most students with me never ever use this, but it's something that you should. And the horn, same thing. If you have a pedestrian that comes out in front of you, you basically want to use the horn to indicate walk faster, don't walk in front of me. Okay, this is a picture of my wife. She's showing what it looks like to be driving with one hand. So uh, that's what you would do. You'd look down the middle part of the car with one hand behind the passenger seat, looking down the middle. There's both hands on the wheel at the 9 and 3 position. They're getting ready to make a hand over hand position where you're... Uh, Turning to the left, you're going to lead with the right hand, cross over with your left, and finish the turn, and then let the wheel spin back. Push-pull is a hand position of 8 and 4. Notice the hands have dropped a little bit here. And what you're going to do is you're going to shuffle the wheel. It's going to be a push and then a pull. A push, then a pull. And you're going to see that in the video a little bit later today. 
Um, foot position, I want you to write down your notes. Always have your right foot for driving. I don't want you to use your left foot for the brake, although it's not illegal to be braking with your left foot. But if you're accelerating with your right foot, braking with your left, if you ever get in a, a situation where you get nervous or confused and you just push down on both feet, you just don't know which one's going to win. So by having your foot on the floor between the gas and the brake and where you're able to pivot, if you make a mistake, it's going to be easy to switch over because you, you're going to know that you made a mistake and you're going to be able to move over to the other position. So heel on the, on the floorboard and just pivot between the two. Okay, that's what it looks like in the driver's ed vehicle. Um, way over to the left, a light tan piece of plastic. That's called a dead pedal. So in your notes, I want you to write down dead pedal. And a dead pedal is where you put your left foot and you're pushing down on that area when you're making a fast turn. So when you're making a fast turn and you push down on your left foot like that, it's going to push the back of your back up against your seat and it's going to keep you upright in the correct posture to make a turn. If you've got your left foot tucked underneath your right foot, you make a fast turn, your body's going to lean on one side or to the other. Okay, we're going to go through some definitions right now. So we're going to go through this and then I'm going to explain um, what I want you to do. Okay, the first thing I want you to write down is light acceleration and you do not have to write down everything that's listed up here. Probably uh, all I want you to write down is the, the second bullet just used for smooth starts. This is what you use at the beginning from a stop sign or a traffic light, a traffic light at the beginning of a turn. And the example I gave is like it's like stepping on a sponge that's been fully submerged in water. And someone says, okay, step on the sponge and just make some of the water ooze out. So you're not stepping on it quickly, but you're just pushing down just a little bit to get a little bit of a trickle. So the same thing with the acceleration. It's just a little bit. If you push all the way down or halfway down, the car is going to lurch forward. Progressive acceleration is a steady increase in pressure on the gas pedal. This is what you normally would use to get up to speed from light acceleration. Once you get to the speed that you want to go, then you're basically maintaining pressure. So most of your driving is going to be this progressive acceleration. Going up a hill, going down a hill, up a hill, down a hill, maintaining speed. Cover brake is when the ball of your right foot, so you've taken your foot away from the gas pedal, the accelerator, and hovering means that you're not hitting the brake pedal, but you're getting ready to activate it because you think something's going to happen. So cover brake is anticipation of a hazard, a problem on the roadway, and you're just going to more likely have to use the brake next rather than the accelerator. So you're basically guessing, I think something's going to happen in a moment. I'm not going to need my gas pedal, so better be over near the brake pedal. Sometimes you use this in coasting, going down heavy traffic. Control braking is just regular braking, just even pressure on the brake pedal. Um, in the third bullet where it says, try not to have the vehicle pitch forward. So I want you to write down the word, the pitch because we're going to have this on a test because it's so important that when you go for your license that they you show you have an understanding of, of how to make the car pitch correctly and pitch is whether you're braking so when you're braking and pitching you're going forward when you're pitching and accelerating you're going backwards so if you don't do light acceleration and you hit the gas pedal too hard the front end is going to lift up, the back end is going to kick in, and you're going to pitch backwards. But if you hit the brake too hard, coming to a traffic light or a stop light, you're going to pitch too hard to the front.
Trail braking is slight decrease of pressure on the brake pedal. It's used in these following situations, the last few seconds of a limousine stop. And what a limousine stop is, about 10 to 15 feet before your stop sign, a limousine driver has been trained to almost bring the limo to a stop there because that takes away a lot of that deceleration and that heavy pitching. So he's going to almost come to a stop, then he's going to let go of the brake pedal a little bit, and he's going to move up a little bit further, and you're going to take away that heavy pitch. Trail braking is used for backing up. When you're in your driveway, you're going backwards, you're going to be on the brake pedal to move the car. You're never going to probably be on the gas pedal in reverse. Going forward in heavy traffic, creeping forward in a parking spot or at the beginning of a turn. And I can always tell when I get you out to drive for the first time and someone says, oh, I've driven Mr. Toll for 20 hours, 30 hours. It's the way people use the brake. That is a dead giveaway what kind of driver you are. I can always tell a good driver by how they brake. Not so much by the way that they maintain their speed or position on the road. It's braking. The big difference is knowing how someone brakes is because they've done it so much, they've really got it down. They know when to cover brake and when to tra trail brake. Threshold braking is maximum force on the brake pedal. It's what you want to use for an emergency. So let's say that a pedestrian ran in front of you. You basically want to hit that brake pedal as hard as you possibly can. Remember, you cannot break your brake. So you can hit it as hard as you want. And I've actually taken students into parking lots, and we're only going 10, 15 miles per hour. And we hit the brake as hard as we possibly can just to see, you know, what it feels like, how to lock them up. It's not too good for the tires at times, not too good for the brakes. But this is a training car, and this is a training program, so we want to kind of get you to where you have a feeling of what that is like. Okay, the accelerator and brake. I want you to write this down, too. The brake is the most important pedal. We talked about this, I think, the first class. It keeps you from going where you don't want to go. So when you're really learning to drive, it's not so much getting up to speed. Is you, you don't want to hit cars. You don't want to go through stop signs or traffic lights. You've probably heard your parents say, brake, 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 more than you've heard them say, go, 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 uh, because they're more nervous about you not using the brake correctly than going faster. And most experienced drivers can learn both pedals probably within about 10 minutes. So when you buy a new car, it, it's just going to seem so much different than the last one that you had. And remember, too, that both pedals can make you either go faster or slower. So think about it. If you're on the gas pedal and you want to go slower, why go to the brake? Just let go of the gas pedal. Depending on the type of road that you're on, the car will slow itself down. Same thing with the brake pedal. If you're braking and you're going too slow, let go of the brake, you'll go faster. Now, this is what I want you to write down in your notes because most of you probably haven't thought about this. Every time that you use the brake pedal and there's someone behind you, they have to use their brake pedal too because they don't know if you're going to be braking into a turn, braking to go into a driveway, braking to come to a complete stop. So if you're hitting the brake all the times that you want to go slower when you should just be letting go of the gas pedal, people are going to beep the horn at you. People are going to tailgate you. They're going to be angry when they're stuck behind you. So learn how to control your speed with your gas pedal probably 80 to 85% of the time. The other 15, 20% of the time, you're going to be doing braking. But you don't brake that much in a car. You really don't. You don't have to. This is what the gauges look. Um, this is going to be part of the video that you're going to be looking at in a minute. Um, I think this might be, let's see what else. Oh, gauges. Let's go through this real quick. This is uh, what you had for your homework. So make sure that you know all this. So I'm going to just go over it really, really super quick. Speedometer, basically how fast you're going. Odometer, how many miles your car has been driven. This is really important for uh, people when they're buying a used vehicle. The odometer has a direct correlation of wear and tear on a vehicle. But you really don't need to know uh, that your car has gone 80,000 miles. Now, the other thing I guess you should write down 
is that your maintenance schedule is based upon miles driven. So the odometer does help you keep your car maintained well. And that's basically what we wanted to cover with a Know Your Vehicle. Tripometer, how many miles your car has driven over a certain period of time, like for a trip. We'll be talking about uh, fuel gauge a little bit later when we talk about filling up with gas. Alternator, gauge a warning light means that there's an electrical problem. That's all I want you to know. So the battery may not be holding a charge or you may need a new alternator. Temperature gauge telling you that you probably don't have um, coolant in your vehicle. It's at a low level. The car is running a little bit hot. So watch for the light. Watch for the gauge that's telling you that you're overheating. Now remember, C on the gauge means cold or cool, and H on your gauge telling you that you're running a little bit hot. So you may have to keep an eye on that, especially for older cars. Okay, Brake warning light only is activated telling you that there may be a problem or there could be a fluid level problem or a leak. So if a brake light comes on, you need your brakes, uh, pull over to the side of the road, uh, see if it's leaking underneath the vehicle. And I'm a firm believer of having some type of roadside service. So if you don't have a AAA or another type of roadside service, I would invest in that because most of, most of us are not mechanics or we don't have the equipment to fix things on the side of the road. So it makes sense because if you break down and you call your parents, and unless they're a mechanic, they're not helping you either. They're calling AAA. They're ca calling the tow truck. They're calling uh, whatever uh, roadside service uh, provider that you have. But eventually, you're going to have to be responsible for this on your own. Oil pressure light is probably one of the most important things to pay attention to because it only tells you that you don't have enough pressure being pumped through the engine. And you've got to stop as quickly as possible. You find a place to pull over. Um, I always like carrying just an extra quart in my car uh, because we do some long driving hours and it does get hot in the summer. Uh, I like to top it off between my oil changes just to make sure that I have enough in it. So you don't want to ruin your engine. I had a daughter that did have her engine oil checked frequently and she uh, blew an engine in Virginia, and uh, an oil change is going to cost you 40 50 bucks. but for her to have a new engine put in, we didn't go that route, but if they were going to fix the engine, they told us it was going to probably be between $2,000 and $2,400. That's a lot of money compared to 50 bucks. So make sure that you get your oil changed on a regular basis. So that's another reason why I wanted you to know what type of oil goes into your car. Other lights that you should know about is your parking lights, seatbelt lights, ABS, so all this stuff. Now, I emailed all of you or texted you a uh, symbol sheet that's got um, symbols on it. Let's see if I can bring it up here. Whoop, let's see if I can get out of this. There we go. Let's see if I can pull one in. Huh. Not let me. Oh, it's probably locked. Hold on. I'm trying to pull in something that you'd be able to see. Uh, it's not letting me. Well, anyways, you, you should have had a, a symbol chart come to you by text message. So, what I want you to do, and I'm going to let you go in just a couple minutes, I, I want you to try to do that. That's why I want you to have the car manual and, and to know your vehicle. If you haven't done that, try to get that in tonight. Um, why isn't that coming up? Maybe the, know your vehicle. Does that come on? Nope. Huh. Let me go back here. Not let me bring these stuff in. I know. Here we go. Let's see if this works. Well, we can't see it that way. Let me get back. Okay. Um, so do the, the symbols. Okay, there's two sheets. Uh, do that. Do the questions to Chapter 5. I want you to do that. And I'm going to see if I can add this in. Hold on just a second. Let's see if I can find... There we go. Okay, once we're done 
in the next two or three minutes. I want you to uh, cancel out of this and text me that you're out of today's session, but then I want you to go back in. Uh, it doesn't have to be right now if you want to do it a little bit later. And I think if you go in about five minutes into this uh, video, it basically kind of goes over what we talked about today, but it, you get to see the vehicle and I kind of go through everything and I grab the directional lever and the windshield wipers and I show you where the hazard lights are and you take a look at the seat and the seat adjustment. So I want you to look, I think it's about 20, 25 minutes long. So go back to YouTube and watch this on YouTube. Do the symbols for tonight um, and text that. Uh, what you think your answers are. Try to get as many as you can. You can use the um, manual that you have for knowing your vehicle, or you could go online to, to find stuff. Um, and do questions to Chapter 5. That is what we've got for homework tonight. Tomorrow, we're going to get into safety devices, seat belts, airbags, helmets, and you've basically been doing that worksheet. So the car controls, that's the, what I just text to you. I'll tell you about the project tomorrow. I'm going to give you over the weekend to do a, um, a project on safety equipment. So tomorrow we're going to talk all about how we're basically protected with all these safety devices. And what is the chances of surviving in a crash. So thanks. Let me get out of this. If I can. So, thanks for uh, tuning in and doing your homework. You guys have been doing a great job uh, for the most part. I've got to take a look at some of the homework that's coming in. I'm going to try to streamline it a little bit. I'm trying to find out what works better with email or sending it through a text message like the car controls. And I might even try to start implementing. I also have a testing uh, program that. I may be able to send out to you and you can answer your questions there and it will correct it for you and send it back to me. So I'm trying to find out the best way that we can do that. But sun is shining. Go outside. Take a walk. Okay. Make the best of this quarantine situation. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a good night.